Okay, great. Let's get started. Uh, once again, good morning, everyone. Ian Andrews uh, with Lakewood Alive. Uh, thanks for being here. This has been a long time uh, coming. Uh, we are really pleased uh, to have uh, Barb Powers, who is the Department Head of Inventory and Registration for the State Historic Preservation Office. Barb's going to walk us through the presentation here in just a moment. Uh, following Barb, we'll hear from uh, Rick Sika and Marsha Mall, who are the principals of Placemark Collaborative, a Lakewood-based a uh, company that uh, works on historic district nominations, among many other uh, historic preservation and historic uh, projects. Also, a special thanks to uh, Mayor Megan George for her uh, enthusiastic support of historic preservation. As a councilwoman, we spent a lot of time talking about this, uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to partner with her uh, and have her support uh, to embrace historic preservation. Also, to former Mayor Michael Summers, who uh, was uh, supportive of this effort uh, near the end of his term and um, in helping us to be able to work with Barb and her team uh, in procuring some grant dollars to then be able to have our consultants uh, from Placemark Collaborative as this is a really a big task to undertake. Uh, also, uh, former planning director Bryce Sylvester who uh, jumped on board uh, with us again near uh, the end of uh, Mayor Summer's term to help us out. And Heather Rudge, who's been a volunteer with Lakewood Alive uh, she has been just a fantastic partner, and she is one of the best tax credit uh, uh, developers and authors uh, in the country, and we're lucky that she lives here in Lakewood, and has helped us out. A brief context, uh, Lakewood Alive, we're a nonprofit community development organization. We were founded uh, in 2004. Uh, our mission is to foster and sustain vibrant neighborhoods. And back in 2004, the organization at the time called Lakewood Community Progress, Inc., adopted the Main Street Program. Uh, which is a national model for historic downtown revitalization. Part of that was to work to ensure that we preserved our historic uh, commercial building stock as best we could. Uh, and over uh, time, we have been uh, slowly pushing this boulder up the hill to get us uh, to this point today. Some of you may remember we had a few public meetings, uh, gosh, about two years ago with Heather uh, as the tax credit expert, Frank Scalish as a developer uh, and property owner of a typical mixed-use building that you'd find in Lakewood. He owns the Veronica over at Ridgewood and Madison. And also Kurt Broski uh, from the Barton Center in the Westerly to talk about a large-scale tax credit project. So uh, we're glad that you're here. I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Barbara Powers. Uh, so Barb, I'm going to unmute you uh, here in just one moment. And uh, again, oh, and also thanks to uh, Councilman Sarah Keppel, uh, who is with us. We really appreciate uh, her support as the newest member uh, of city council. I also appreciate uh, Rob Donaldson, who is our design committee chair and has been by my side this whole time uh, helping me to move this forward. Uh, and then our friend Allison Henney, who is a planner uh, with the city of Lakewood. I would appreciate her being here. And we did see that Tom Bullock, councilman, uh, will be joining us and our state representative, Mike Skindell. So without further ado, uh, Barb Powers, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to unmute uh, and you should be good to go. So please take it away. I am, and you can go to the next slide, Ian. Thanks. Thank you, Ian, and thank you to everyone for joining our webinar today, and thank everyone who has played a role in um, making this happen, making this National Register designation um, happen for downtown Lakewood. Well, pre-COVID-19, I would be in person in Lakewood having a Another cup of coffee with all of you and um, speaking to you in person to share this information and planning on how I could get some Mitchell's ice cream for my trip back down to Columbus. But short of that, um, I am here and will be sharing with you um, the information associated with the National Register of Historic Places program. We're going to, through this webinar, learn about exactly what the National Register program is, what National Register listing means and does not mean to property owners and to the community. We'll talk about the National Register process and where the, Nash, the, the proposed nomination for the Lakewood Downtown Historic District is in that process. And we will um, also talk about the over, give an overview of the um, National Register nomination itself. And we will be taking questions and providing answers to your questions about the National Register. As Ian said, I'm Department Head for Inventory and Registration within the State Historic Preservation Office. And 
we are a division of the Ohio History Connection. That we were most recently known as the Ohio Historical Society. The State Historic Preservation Office identifies historic places in Ohio, nominates properties to the National Register of Historic Places, reviews federally assisted projects for effects on historic architectural and archeological resources in Ohio, consults on the conservation of older buildings and sites and offers educational programs and publications. And today we are going to specifically be talking about the National Register of Historic Places program. So let's get to the next slide. The National Register of Historic Places is the official list of properties worthy of preservation for their significance in American history, archaeology, architecture, engineering, and culture. The National Register was created by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, and as it has been amended, and that act set up the register and it created a federal state system to administer the program through, in Ohio, the State Historic Preservation Office and our local partners. Nominations for listing properties come from the State Preservation Office, private individuals, organizations, and local governments often initiate this process and prepare the necessary documentation. The National Register te listing tells property owners, local officials, interested groups, and citizens, you have something worthy of preservation. But pretty much leaves, as we'll find out this morning, the decision-making about what that means to the people that are most closely associated with the properties and most importantly, the property owners, the local community. Next slide. Hey friends, real quick. I'm sorry, Barb, I meant to mention, if anyone has any questions, uh, please type them in the thought bubble. I will monitor the questions. And then once we get to the end uh, of Barb's presentation, before we go to Rick and Marsha, uh, we'll be sure to ask those. So please uh, ask your questions, type them into the little thought bubble uh, and we'll get to those. Okay, Barb, go right ahead. Okay. So there are three main ingredients that every National Register prop property um, has to have. First of all, age. Typically properties are 50 years or older and there can be some exceptions to that. Significance. The National Register evaluates significance by four main criteria for evaluation, A, B, C, and D. These criteria explain why the property is important in history, architecture, or culture. The criteria addresses a property's significance in history, their association with important people, architectural design or stylistic significance, and information potential. Properties can be listed in the National Register at a national level of significance, a state level or a local level of significance. And I can tell you the majority of Ohio's National Register nominations, as well as nominations across the, the United States, are rec typically recognized, most of them are recognized for that local level of importance. And the third ingredient is in historic integrity. The National Register program is really about place-based history. Um, properties have to retain historic characteristics in order to convey their significance. And properties convey that through location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So, Every National Register nomination identifies one or more of the National Register criteria for which the property uh, is eligible or applies under, and it explains how that significance covered through the criteria is then reflected 
physically through characteristics that convey that significance and allow the property to maintain its historic integrity. So next slide, Ian. What, what types of properties are listed in the National Register? Well, individual properties may be listed, such as the Powell Crosley home in Cincinnati, structures like the locks associated, lock remnants associated with the Ohio and Erie Canal, Sites, typically sites are often archeological in nature or represent our uh, strong heritage in Ohio of mounds and earthworks, but sites can also be designed landscapes like the Mill Creek Park in Youngstown, Ohio. Or properties can be listed as objects like the Toronto World War I monument in Jefferson County. Next slide. Next slide, thanks. Or historic districts, and that's really what we're talking about today. Uh, historic district nominations are represent cohesive collections of historic properties that together help to tell the history of a specific area. They can be commercial districts, um, like the Lakewood Downtown Historic District is. They could be large rural um, entire townships like Elizabeth Township in Miami County that are collections of um, historic farms and farmland and lanes and other uh, aspects. They can be residential neighborhoods or college campuses. Historic district nominations, like we're talking about today, the Lakewood Downtown District, are nominations that document the history, significance, and architectural character of the proposed historic district. In other words, they help, they tell the story of the history of the area. In every nomination, what's explained in that nomination through the documentation, historic images, mapping, and photographs, is the applicable National Register criteria covering the specific areas of significance um, illustrated by the history of the district. And there's always a period of significance, meaning the time period which the historic properties show, that concentration of um, history that's um, shown through the um, historic properties included within the boundaries of the historic district. In historic districts, there's a boundary and all of the properties within that boundary are listed in the National Register. Typically, they are broken down into two types of properties. Properties that we say contribute to the historic district, those are building sites, structures, or objects that were built during the historic time period associated with the district, and they add to the historic and architectural significance and character of the district. Additionally, there can be properties that are considered non-contributing. These are properties that were not built during the historic time period, or they are properties that have been altered um, so that they no longer convey their historic associations and appearance. Otherwise, they don't retain historic integrity. They no longer add to the overall understanding of the district. So obviously, the goal is to have less non-contributing properties than contributing properties, but um, likewise, you would not draw a boundary that kind of zigzagged around and just avoided all the non-contributing properties. That's just usually not uh, feasible. Additionally, within any historic district, there is also just a relationship of buildings to one another um, that help uh, conveyed also through their setting or landscape or specific architectural details, features, signage, um, that help, again, convey that historic character and nature to that district. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. 
Here we see the uh, proposed historic district boundaries. And we've just quickly uh, listed the National Register criteria, A and C, the period of significance, 1864 to 1974, the areas of significance, settlement, commerce, architecture, that are associated and documented in the Lakewood Downtown Historic District. There are 90 contributing properties. Two of them have already been listed and there are 15 non-contributing. Rick Sika, co-author for Lakewood Downtown Historic District nomination, will be giving us a brief overview of the nomination uh, in, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to cover the basic information about the National Register program and process. Just wanted to orient you to what we're talking about here through the proposed district. So next slide. So what does the National Register listing not do? National Register listing does not affect a property owner's rights, period. Listing in the National Register places neither restrictions, restrictions or requirements on a private property owner. You may do with the property as you wish within the framework of local laws or ordinances. National Register listing should not be confused with the community's local ordinances that may set up design review. And I think you all have local design review that it impacts the downtown here in Lakewood. Oftentimes, the National Register can be the impetus for initiating local guidelines, but it is not a direct result of National Register listing. And as I said, in this case, the National Register listing is, is following up on local designation. Through National Register listing, you are not required to maintain the property in any specific way. You may even demolish the property as long as federal funds are not used. National Register listing does not lead to public acquisition and it does not require public access to a property. Next slide. So what does the National Register mean? Well, basically the National Register is an important planning and educational tool. When properties within a community are recognized in the National Register, Property owners, local decision makers know what properties are significant and can use that information to make informed decisions. There's a sense of pride and recognition as worthy of preservation for historic and architectural significance. The National Register identifies significant historic resources and can help raise awareness of the value of historic preservation through local programming, walking tours, applications that use the information provided in the National Register nomination. National Register designation can help lessen the negative impact on a historic property from federal projects. Properties listed individually or as part of historic districts listed in the National Register are given special consideration in the planning of federally funded or licensed projects. What's known as Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act requires that all federally funded projects be coordinated with the State Historic Preservation Office to determine their impact upon historic properties. This review is a routine part of the planning process for federally assisted projects. The review does not guarantee that the property will not be affected or even demolished, but does ensure that there will be an opportunity to consider effects of the project before it occurs and encourage public participation. Now, I want to stress one more thing, because this is something that is often uh, a source of confusion. Oftentimes, people think, for whatever reason, well, I don't want to have a property listed on the National Register because I don't want to have to go through that 
Section 106 review process? Well, it is the use of federal money or the need for a federal permit or license that triggers the review of that federal project, federally funded project, not the National Register listing. And in fact, here's where the planning part comes in. If, if properties are listed and recognized as being significant to the National Register, communities know that up front. And when there are federal projects being utilized that may be impacting those, those properties, those areas, decisions can be made, in, again, informed by the fact that there is a historic area that needs to be taken into consideration. And lastly, I want to mention the historic rehabilitation tax credits. Income producing buildings, commercial, industrial, or residential rental listed in the National Register or contributing to a National Register listed district may qualify for state and federal historic tax credits for the rehabilitation of the historic buildings. These incentives if a property owner chooses to use them, encourage capital investment in historic buildings and spur revitalization of historic properties by allowing favorable tax treatments for rehabilitation. And I don't think I need to tell people of the tremendous impact of historic rehabilitation tax credits to historic properties, historic neighborhoods, commercial centers across Ohio and certainly in the Cleveland and greater Cleveland area. So it is a very uh, attractive incentive associated with National Register listing for income producing properties. Condos and single family owner occupied properties do not qualify for the historic tax credits. And to get, to, to get back to the National Register, the National Register documentation helps in the ultimate review of historic tax credit projects um, and how the works being proposed meets the Secretary of Interior standards because the National Register nomination is documenting the historic character defining features of a partic particular properties or the district overall and presenting significance significant period period of significance that helps to um, aid in the review of those those types of properties seeking tax credits. So next slide. I'm going to wrap up here with the process. Nominations are made through the State Historic Preservation Office of the Ohio History Connection. Anyone can prepare a National Register nomination, meaning that you do not have to be the property owner to prepare the nomination. However, all owner, owners are notified and given the opportunity to comment on the nomination before a property is actually listed in the National Register. There is a three-part review process to every National Register nomination. Proposed nominations are submitted to the State Historic Preservation Office staff, and we work with the applicants and with the authors of the National Register nomination to make sure we have a complete nomination that the criteria, period of significance, historic integrity, and all the pieces and parts that make up the nomination are in place and thoroughly document the information to support the property's significance and historic integrity. Nominations are then sent to the Ohio Historic Site Preservation Advisory Board, the State Review Board for Ohio. This board is a 17-member board um, Governor appointed, they are made up of architects, historians, archeologists, architectural historians, uh, public members, and their charge is to review every National Register nomination submitted to 
the State Historic Preservation Office to determine whether or not the property nomination meets the National Register criteria, possesses historic integrity, and should be nominated to the National Register. So they advise our office about each National Register nomination. The board meets four times a year and their next meeting is June 19th and that's when this, this nomination will be considered. Lastly, the National Register nominations are sent, signed by the State Historic Preservation Office and sent to the National Park Service. National Register program. And it's at that level where the properties are actually listed in the National Register. So next slide. The property owners and local officials are notified of nominations to the National Register. Lakewood is recognized as a certified local government through the State Preservation Office and the National Park Service, which means they have created a local preservation program. And as such, they have a role in, in the review of National Register nominations. The um, chief elected official and the certified local government contact, they are notified 60 days prior to that state review board meeting. So in this case, about mid-April, um, about the proposed nomination, given a copy of the final version of the nomination and asked to comment on it. Um, likewise, we notify, private, we notify property owners. And in the case, like Lakewood downtown, when we have more than 50 property owners, what we do is we're, the National Register regulations call for us to put in a legal notice in the local paper, which explains in writing pretty much everything we're covering today in this webinar. And in Ohio, we always do a public meeting. And here we are. So this is what we're, uh, this, as I said, usually we do these in person in the community. But since we can't do that, we are fortunate enough and we're very thankful that Lakewood Alive um, is helping us get the word out about this and also to host the meeting. So the National Register of Historic Places it establishes a process for property owners to comment on a proposed nomination. This process is based in the understanding that the National Register listing does not affect property owners' rights. Property owners and others are welcome to comment on the proposed National Register nomination for the Lakewood Downtown Historic District. Such comments are not required and the National Register process is really presented with the idea of the affirmative, meaning that if you if we do not receive comments from a property owner, they are presumed to support the nomination. The National Register program provides private property owners the ability to object to the proposed National Register nomination for listing in the National Register. If opposing the nomination, the burden of responsibility is placed on the property owner and their letter of objection must be notarized to confirm their ownership of a property within the historic district boundaries. If a majority of property owners object to nominating the Lakewood Downtown Historic District to the National Register, the nomination will not be listed in the National Register, but will be reviewed to determine if it is eligible for the National Register. And I just want to um, expand a little bit on that because this is an important distinction. Properties, in order to uh, for a property to apply and utilize the historic tax credits, properties have to be listed in the National Register, either individually or contributing to a listed district, as I've mentioned before. If an area is determined eligible, for the National Register, 
that doesn't mean it's listed. So properties cannot take, property owners cannot take advantage of the historic tax credits, but the area is determined eligible for national register listing. So the use of federal funds will still trigger the review of that project and how it's impacting that historic district. Next slide. So here we are, the board meeting that is going to consider this um, nomination will be on June 19th, beginning at 10 a.m. And due to COVID-19, that meeting will be an online um, meeting conducted through Zoom, web-based meeting. So you are all invited to attend that meeting and public comments will be um, um, asked for by the board and you will be able to um, hear the board's deliberation on the nominations and that day the board will make their recommendation to the state historic preservation office on this and the other nominations on the agenda so please um, check our website because we will be um, the www.ohiohistory.org we will be posting the registration information for that webinar um, at least one week prior to the meeting. And um, I believe we're planning on getting that up there earlier than that. If you want to comment on the nomination, write a letter of support, which we certainly welcome. Or if you choose to send in a, a, nom or a letter that objects to the listing, that correspondence should be sent to the State Historic Preservation Officer, Bert Logan, at the address below. And we're gonna ask, um, try to field your questions right now, but at any time, if you have additional questions, please feel free to contact me. And right now, the best way to contact me is via um, my email address. So we're going to come back to this screen uh, at the very end of our presentation. Go to the next slide and we can um, see what kind of questions people have at this point. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Ian back with you. Just a reminder, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the uh, comment bubble uh, on your little control panel. Uh, so far, we do not uh, have any uh, questions other than asking if the webinar was to be recorded. Yes, it is being recorded, uh, and we will uh, share this uh, with the broader community, and it will be uh, preserved for all time. So uh, it is being recorded. <laughs> so um, uh, we do not have any questions right now. We'll give it just another moment, and then we can transition uh, to Rick and Marsha if that's appropriate, Barb. Okay. Wow. Well. Okay. We'll, we'll hold on and see. You're a very informed group, which is good, which shows that the local people have done their um, a great job of getting the word out and helping everyone understand what this means and doesn't mean. Okay, uh, we do have a question. Uh, oh. Great, thank you. Uh, no, this is great. So uh, Sarah asked, um, she wanted to know if, uh, in which way the City of Lake would be able uh, to be supportive uh, potential letter of support or resolution. Uh, and Sarah, uh, thank you for that. We will look to city uh, council uh, and uh, your leadership, if you would, be able to introduce uh, a resolution to council um, to uh, support this nomination. If you would like to do that, we would welcome that. The mayor also sent over a letter of support. In fact, I just received it uh, as soon as the webinar uh, began today. So we'll be submitting that to the State Historic Preservation Office. So uh, Councilman Keppel, thank you very much. Uh, Gary Rosen asks the question, what properties so far uh, would be included. Do we want uh, Rick and Marsha, I'm going to unmute you. Do you want to uh, answer that when we get into your section? Would that be appropriate for you guys? Sure, that would be fine. Okay, great. And just to be clear uh, uh, for folks, 
The district essentially, uh, just as a quick recap, essentially runs, I'm gonna go back far for just a moment, runs from uh, Bunce, thinking Winking Lizard, down to uh, the uh, where James Games uh, meets Cozumel uh, on the west. Uh, so here again, you can see the map uh, where it works its way uh, down the street, uh, and also including uh, going up Warren Road to the south, uh, particularly on the west side of the street up to the condos and on the uh, east side of the street, uh, including Key Bank, the old post office building. So uh, Rick and Marsh will get to that. Also have a question um, from Paula. Wanted to know if uh, those in the public who support a surf preservation, Barb, could you answer this question? Would it be advantageous uh, for uh, residents to uh, write uh, letters of support in favor of the nomination? Um Certainly, any any support, any letter, anybody that wants to, you know, write letters to support the nomination, those are always very welcome. Uh, we share those. Obviously, we share those with the board members so that they are aware that there's um, support for the nomination, and those letters are sent forwarded with the nomination packet to the National Register as well, and and we remain as documentation in our files as well too. So it's, you know, it's good. It shows there's local knowledge and awareness of the district and um, we love to see support in the letters. I just want to make it clear that it's, it's not a, it's not a voting process, so to speak, or every property owner doesn't have to necessarily weigh in um, with their opinion on the nomination. All right, thanks, Barb. Um, and this is a question uh, that I would ask uh, if you can uh, briefly address, and then Rick and Marsha, I think you'll also want to touch on this as well. Uh, Craig, thanks for the question, asks, uh, who can help building owners with tax credits or programs that might be in the works? Okay, well, our office, the State Historic Preservation Office, can certainly, um, we have information on our website about the historic, the federal historic tax credits and the um, state historic tax credits and um, our technical preservation services staff are available to help you understand the process and how the process works and how to apply. Lisa Brownell with the, um, the Development Services Agency sure if I'm saying that right, but she's the she's the um, with the state agency that oversees the state historic preservation tax credit. She can help you with the process. And I know there are uh, numerous um, preservation professionals um, right there in Lakewood um, city boundaries that have a lot of experience and knowledge of working directly with projects that are seeking the historic tax credit uh, uh, projects. So does that answer Great. the question? Uh, I think so far, but Craig, if you have a follow-up, please uh, please uh, go ahead and submit a follow-up and then Rick and Marsha, once you get going, if you wouldn't mind keeping that question in mind. Uh, any uh, Anything else before we transition to uh, Rick and Marsha from Placemark Collaborative? I'm gonna advance the slides. That's good. Yeah. Thank you for the questions, everyone. We'll keep them coming and I'll continue to monitor. We do have one more. Um, Randy, uh, thanks for the question. Are there any plans to improve and enhance the streetscape? Uh, so uh, I will say that um, uh, the city of Lakewood has been looking at streetscape improvements. Councilman Bullock uh, introduced um, uh, the idea during the budget process last year, and there is some money set aside for streetscaping. Uh, one of our city planners, uh, Allison Henney, is on this call right now, and so uh, she and her team, I know they're looking at uh, ways, to, um, ways to beautify the street. Uh, we've been working on some different projects, including on Warren Road, putting in the, the public art mural at Detroit and Warren, the bus shelter with public art, which unfortunately someone drove their car into and destroyed. Uh, so that was great. And then also the uh, the new project that's coming up at Warren and Madison, uh, uh, both projects funded by the county with public art murals, uh, new street trees, new bus shelter, so trying to spruce those intersections up. So there is some money uh, set aside uh, that the planning department will be looking at uh, implementing throughout the year. So, uh, Randy, I'll try to connect you with someone at uh, planning if you have any further questions. We're going to move on to Rick and Marsha now from uh, Placemark Collaborative. Uh, so, uh, Rick and Marsha, this is the uh, the first slide of your uh, piece of the deck 
uh, correct? And if so, take it away. Hi, I'm Marsha Mall. And I'm Rick Sika. Thanks everyone for joining uh, Lakewood Alive this morning. Uh, so what we're going to do is give a brief overview of the uh, historic district, its history and its architecture. The nomination itself is uh, more than 160 pages, uh, plus a spreadsheet on every building and its construction history and a set of 68 photos. So there's a lot of information for Lakewood Alive and, and the community to, uh, to use and uh, share with everyone. Briefly on the map, um, just to uh, note at the bottom, the two properties that are already listed on the National Register are the three buildings in the Westerly Apartment Complex and the uh, Detroit Warren Building. The non-contributing, which says 15, and those are almost all buildings that um, have been built since 1974. Um, it's not a, it's not a, value-laden judgment call. It's just those buildings aren't 50 years of age, so it, and so they're just considered non-contributing. There are a couple of buildings um, that are more than 50 years old that have been um, so changed that one wouldn't know um, that they were of that age. And the one example I'm thinking of is the Drug Mart Plaza. Um, which um, is a building that actually goes back to the mid 20th century, but has had uh, several renovations. And it you know, looks like a building from the last 10 years because that's when the current facade was put on, um, but it's actually much older. That would be an example of a non-contributing. Um, next slide. Uh, so the areas of significance, um, you know, Generally, this is considered a collection of historic resources illustrating the establishment, growth, and growth of an historic 20th century streetcar suburb. So as Barb mentioned on the criteria, A is the association with broad patterns of history. So in this historic district, there's settlement, illustrating the early development of the community in the 19th century, because there are actually several buildings that still exist that date to that time in the district and commerce as the linear core of Lakewood's 20th century downtown. Next. The other criteria is C for architecture and that is the fact that there are just block after block of 19th and 20th century architectural styles and building types in the district as well as a lot of prominent local, regional and national architects who have buildings in the district. And we'll be, as you see the, the slides of this, you'll be able to, um, we've noted uh, photos with uh, architectural styles and we'll comment on a couple of occasions on the architects. Next. So the period of significance begins in 1864 and that is the date of the earliest existing building in the district, the Curtis Hall House. Um, and it ends in 1974 with the completion of the Lakewood Center North Office Building and Parking Garage and the final building in the Westerly Apartment Complex. So that's slightly less than 50 years old, um, but the nomination, the National Register process gives a little bit of flexibility um, for several years around the 50-year the uh, standard um, when there's something about a development pattern or a significant building that was completed in that time frame. Next. So there are several periods of development for the historic districts and we're gonna just briefly touch on these five. There are two dating to the um, 19th century and then the streetcar era and then the post streetcar era as well. Next. So this is Lakewood in 1874. The historic district is roughly the area uh, inside the orange oval. So as you can see, there are buildings along Detroit Avenue. Those would be primarily houses. And Lakewood at that point is made up of large farms. You can see the, the parcels that extend you know, from Detroit all the way north to the lake or all the way south to uh, what became Madison Avenue. Next. 
So at, in the 19th century in Lakewood, it was a thriving area of large farms, primarily vineyards and orchard and food crops for the Cleveland market. Marcia and I have a glass bottle with a cork stopper from the uh, Lakewood Horseradish Company, for example. Um, in the mid 19th century, um, uh, one of the transportation improvements was the Plank Road and its toll houses. So literally what is now Strand Avenue was a road of wooden planks. It extended from five miles west of the Rocky River all the way down to present day 25th Street in Cleveland. Um, wood frame or stone houses along Detroit. Um, but times were also changing because in 1889, more than 100 uh, residents and landowners petitioned the county to form the hamlet of Lakewood because they were starting to see the real estate possibilities of converting farms to uh, residential subdivisions. Next. So from the period 1835 to 1879, county records show that there are only about 11 existing buildings in Lakewood. 10 of those are single family houses, including the Curtis Hall house, and one of them is a school, East Rockport Central on Warren Road. Next. Um, this is uh, the Curtis Hall house, both in a vintage picture and, uh, and where it is. And you really need to be on the side street to see it really well because the building that has sweet designs uh, was built in front of it in the uh, early 20th century. Next. And the other building um, being East Rockport Central School, designed by Coburn and Barnum, who are a very prominent 19th century uh, Cleveland architectural firm. Next. So the next phase is, the, is establishing an effective village, 1890 to 1909. 1893, the Detroit Avenue streetcar line opens. Uh, Construction on Detroit Avenue includes houses, but there's also a transition to commercial and institutional uses. The residential side streets begin to develop, leading north and south from Detroit. And Lakewood's population starts to grow, uh, increasing from just a few hundred people in 1885 to a few thousand people just 15 years later. And in 1903, Lakewood becomes a village. Next. So this time period, now there are about 2,600 existing buildings in Lakewood that date to this 20 year period. And there are 13 of them in the historic district, um, mostly houses and commercial buildings. Next. So for example, there are these two commercial buildings side by side um, on Detroit, just east of Warren. Next. Um, as well as the uh, Edgar Building and the Hall Block, a two-part commercial block is a building type rather than a style. And that simply means there's a very definitive difference between uh, the design of the first floor and the second floor of the building because the first floor is for um, commercial retail uses. And then upstairs in both of these cases were designed as apartments and the building design changes in the windows and, and all of its details. Next. There are also two churches from this from this period, and uh, including the earlier portion of Lakewood Presbyterian Church. Next, um, a school from this period as well, what we now know as, as Grand School, both uh, the original building dating to 1899 facing Warren, and then around on the other side on Victoria Avenue, the 1906 edition, which is really which is as large as the original school. Next. So the period 1910 to 1929 and, the, and becoming a city, this is the height of the streetcar era. Uh, the streetcar lines on Detroit put in in 1893, Clifton Boulevard, 1902, Madison Avenue, 1917. And in 1911, Lakewood became a city. Population growth is tremendous. From 500 people to 15,000 people 20 years later to 70,000 people by 1930. Downtown Lakewood evolves with dense development, including various uses, commercial, office, multifamily, institutional, and civic. And in the 1920s, there's the first appearance of automobile-related buildings. Next. <clears throat> 
Almost 10,000 existing buildings in Lakewood date to this period, and that's almost 70% of all existing buildings in the city. There are almost 60 buildings in the historic district from this period, and a lot of them are either apartment buildings and commercial buildings, because one aspect of the nomination is it not only includes the buildings fronting on Detroit and Warren, it also includes about a dozen apartment buildings that are on the side streets that are just you know one or 200 feet off of Detroit Avenue, because that was also indicative of the streetcar era development, because the folks in those apartments would not have had automobiles. They would have either um, been pedestrians or they would have used the mass transit that was available to them on Detroit or down at Clifton. Next. <clears throat> So from this period, club and fraternal organizations, there's the Lakewood Tennis Club that became the uh, Lakewood Elks Lodge and the Masonic uh, Temple as well. Next. Churches, both um, Lakewood Methodist Episcopal. Um, Badgley and Nicholas designed uh, churches all over the Eastern United States and in several foreign countries as well. The First Church of Christ Scientist uh, by Charles Draper Faulkner in Chicago. He was an architect of choice of uh, Christian science entities and uh, he designed buildings for um, Christian science edifices all over the country as well. Next. <clears throat> Apartment buildings. Here's an example of a couple on side streets on uh, a Spanish style building on Lakeland and a neoclassical style building on Marlowe named the Marlowe. Next. Commercial buildings, Detroit Warren, um, as well as uh, the Gehring building across the street from, from it. Next. Uh, more commercial buildings, but at a smaller scale. Um, the building with sweet designs in it, as well as the uh, Curtis block. Next. Financial institutions. Um, part of First Federal now, but originally the Lakewood State Bank and, and also part of First Federal, but a really unusual and frankly, really cool um, Egyptian revival style um, building. Next, automobile related buildings that are starting to come in, the Bailey Buick Company um, from the mid 1920s, as well as a Pocahontas Oil Company service station. Next. Uh, Great Depression and World War II. Obviously minimal construction during this period. Two downtown buildings were completed in 1930. Their construction had already started and two new buildings that were built were utility and civic related. Next. So from almost 10,000 buildings in the previous 20 years, less than 600 existing buildings in Lakewood from uh, this period and most of those, and always in those totals, it's almost always uh, single and two family houses make up most of it. Only eight buildings in the district, mostly commercial. Next. So um, Bailey Company Department Store at Warren in Detroit was finished in 1930, as well as an apartment building on Manor Park Avenue. And remember the name Morrison Weinberg as well, they'll come back later. Uh, to New buildings that were built during this period, the post office on Warren and the uh, Ohio Bell Telephone Exchange building. So this building replaced the Telephone Exchange building um, where uh, Dimit Architects is currently located. Rick, are you there? Hello, Rick. You may have lost Rick. You guys want to try to um, reconnect or, or call back in? I'm happy to go ahead, Rick. Are you there? Yeah, we're here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. okay. I have no idea what happened. Just keep going. How long did we? Where we at? Just 15 seconds, just keep on going. It's a little spotty, but you're, you're good to go.
in the uh, no, mid 1940s. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. The streetcar line shut down between the late 1940s and mid 1950s. Um, responding to the urban sprawl after after World War II and interstate highways, Lakewood leaders promoted a strategy to construct new modern buildings to retain and attract residents, workers, and shoppers. That leads to the Gold Coast um, and all of the apartments and condos along the lake. And it also leads to several large construction projects in downtown Euclid. And the architectural styles, I'm sorry, I said, Marcia pointed out that I said Euclid. I was thinking about another set of high rises um, in Lakewood. Um, and the architectural styles uh, shift to a completely new set of designs. Next. Um, 13 buildings from the historic district in this period, a combination of apartment buildings and commercial and office. Next. So there's the, uh, what was originally a, a bank building on Detroit as well as um, Hickson's. That's the, the sort of 1959 front that everybody knows on that building. Um, but what's in the middle is a 1936 section that was originally built as an auto wash and the original brick floor of that building is still there in the shop and you can um that you can walk on and hickson's is also listed in this nomination because of its historic significance with bill hickson who is an internationally known uh floral designer and teacher and for his work for more than 30 years beginning in the 1980s as one of the chief floral designers at the White House for their Christmas seasonal decorations, as well as uh, at state and other formal events. Next. So the name that you noticed on the small bank, Theodore Badowski, um, his name comes up quite frequently here. He was also the architect of the INA office building. Um, he'll come up again later. Um, on Warren, there's the Kirtland House Apartments. Um, and for those of you who recognize the name of Delbert Klein, he was also the architect of the uh, small medical office building that is now the Haber Center and home of the Lakewood Historical Society. Next, um, Theodore Badowski again, both with um, Lakewood Center North and uh, the parking garage was uh, built with it behind. Next. And finally, um, the three buildings in the Westerly complex. So the Weinberg from, from Morris and Weinberg in the Bailey department store, he is here with as lead partner in another firm. And Weinberg and Tier were known um, throughout the country for their design of public housing estates, as well as um, elderly high rise buildings. Uh, the Westerly was the first use in the state of Ohio of HUD's 202 program for um, elderly housing. And that's the end of our talk. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, Rick and Marsha, I appreciate that. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please uh, type them into the uh, comment bubble while we have Rick, Marsha, uh, and Barb Powers. I do have a question uh, from Tom. Uh, Tom writes, uh, what is the significance of the A, B, and C districts? Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Um, nothing. Um, because the district was so large, um, we needed to do detailed maps for each of those three sections. And uh, it just provided more clarity in the photo key for the 68 um, photos that were um, included with the nomination so that each of those locations that each of those photos were taken could be marked. And they, they just go in reverse order because uh, building number one started with um, Lakewood Tennis Club, Elks Lodge, and then moved west and then came back east. Thanks for the question. So it wasn't your way of trying to show favorites? No. <laughs> oh, no, definitely not. Not a letter grade. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> any uh, any other questions uh, from folks? We still have a little bit of time, and we're, we're glad that you're uh, joining us today. Uh, yes, Dave, a copy of this slideshow uh, will be available. We also are recording this webinar uh, and it should be uh, set to go by tomorrow. 
uh, the uh, platform that we use, as soon as we end this webinar, it starts to get it prepped and ready to go. So we'll make sure to send this out to everybody who uh, was on the call today, uh, as well as those who couldn't make it and, and make sure that it's posted. We'll just give it another minute or so and be mindful of everyone's time, but if you do have any questions, please feel free. Okay, folks, um, one last opportunity to ask any questions. All right, seeing none, uh, please, uh, we'll kind of wrap up, but if you do have any final questions, I'll be able to jump in. Uh, Barb, if you want to um, show us off the stage here, and, and then I'll kind of do a quick little wrap up. Uh, go ahead, Barb Powers. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Again, I just want to thank you and Rick and Marcia for working on and uh, preparing this nomination. I think you can see it's a very thorough documentation of the history and significance and architectural character of downtown Lakewood. And I should mention that with the timing um, coming up at the June 19th board meeting and then being sent to sometimes the board uh, has comments or suggestions that they like to see um, in the nomination. So once the, nom the board meeting has passed, National Register staff will finalize and work with the authors to um, address any additional items that are needed for the nomination packet. Then it'll be signed and sent to the National Park Service. We should hear uh, that the district has been listed in the National Register probably sometime later in the summer, sometime in August or uh, possibly early September timing wise. So again, thank you all. And I hope next time I'm seeing you in Lakewood, in person. All right, folks. Um, yes, we have a question. Gary, thank you. Uh, the papers that we downloaded, uh, do we fill these out and send them in to you? Uh, Barb, is, um, would you be able to answer that question or would you like a clarification? I'm not sure I understand what the paper is. I'm, Gary, if you wouldn't mind, I can, uh, if you wouldn't mind, let us know what the paper is that you downloaded, or we can just connect you directly with Barb. And, and while we're waiting that for that to follow up on one, um, one question that was asked about um, assistance with building renovations uh, and consultants, um, both Frank Scalish, uh, who we did his building in, in Birdtown, and and Kurt Broski at the Westerly both used uh, uh, consultants to assist with the tax credit process. So that might be uh, two people that that person could could reach out to. And if they don't know those folks directly, certainly Ian can put that person in in touch. Absolutely. So uh, Gary just said that the papers uh, they downloaded from the State Historic Preservation Office uh, to send them in uh, into you, Barb. And if we need any uh, further clarification, I'm happy to give Gary a, a call. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Gary, I'll give you a call today. We'll we'll touch base. And and again, just to clarify to folks, once this district is listed, all of these properties are in the boundaries of the district are listed in the National Register. So no, no, they don't need to be singled out and separately nominated. They'll be part of the listed historic district. Got it, got it. Uh, okay, um, thanks everybody uh, very much. Um, we appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today. Please let us know uh, if you have additional questions uh, and we'll be happy to uh, pass those along. Uh, Barb, thank you for uh, joining us uh, from Columbus. Uh, Rick and Marsha, uh, based out of Lakewood, we appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us today. And um, so yeah, uh, stay tuned. Uh, more to come on uh, the continuation of this process, and we look forward to uh, being in touch. So we wish everyone uh, good health, and we'll talk with you soon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.